Hello, everyone. My name is Yvonne Michael. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health, and I'm a member of Drexel's Delta Omega Committee. We are very excited to welcome you to, to this evening's Public Health Week webinar co-sponsored by the Delta Omega chapters at Rutgers University School of Public Health and the Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health. We are very fortunate to have two outstanding speakers joining us this evening to talk about their research and practice in maternal and child health. And I'll let my co-host Mitchell Rosen talk a bit more about the substance of our event in a couple of minutes. Uh, before that, I wanna talk a little bit about Delta Omega. Delta Omega is a national honor society for public health. There are currently over 80 chapters in the United States with more than 13,000 members. Delta Omega membership is open to faculty, alumni, and students in recognition of outstanding accomplishment in scholarship, research, and practice. This webinar is our very first joint Delta Omega event, um, and we see this as an opportunity to build connections between faculty and students at Rutgers and Drexel, and also an opportunity to raise awareness about Delta Omega. So I encourage each of you out there to learn more about what Delta Omega is doing at your school or wherever you are. I'll put links to our respective Delta Omega webpage um, in the chat feature uh, so that you can find out more information online. Um, and with that, I'll turn this over to Mitchell Rosen. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mitchell Rosen and I'm an associate professor at the Rutgers School of Public Health and I'm director of our Center for Public Health Workforce Development. Welcome to our webinar on maternal child health. I wanna thank our colleagues at the Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health, especially Yvonne and Philip Massey for collaborating to bring this webinar to you. For 25 years, APHA has designated the first week of April as National Public Health Week, a time to honor public health professionals. This year, we are mindful of our public health officials doing heroic work on the front lines of the COVID-19 response. But we also salute them for working to keep our residents healthy and protecting our communities each and every day of the year. I also wanna acknowledge our public health students who are starting their careers and learning why a career in public health is so important. As part of National Public Health Week, APHA has selected themes for each day. Today's theme is maternal child health. APHA says that we should encourage policymakers to pass laws that create a more equitable and just society, address access to prenatal and perinatal care for mothers and babies in communities with limited maternal health care, and to ensure the health of mothers and babies throughout their lifespan. We want you to ask questions during the webinar, so please use the chat box to ask your questions. You can type them in the chat box at any time. We'll have some time to answer a few questions after each presentation, and then more time after both speakers have concluded. So with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Dr. Leslie Cantor is a widely recognized public health leader, researcher, educator, and advocate. She currently serves as the inaugural chair of the Department of Urban Global Public Health at our Rutgers School of Public Health. Her research, in, her research, intervention development, and policy work has focused on sexual and reproductive health. Dr. Cantor was formerly the Vice President of Education at Planned Parenthood Federation of America and a member of the faculty at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. I'll turn it over to you, Leslie. So if you can pull up your slides, that would be great. I do wanna stop yours. Okay, there we go. Great. Well, thank you everybody for uh, being here. When we first talked about this webinar, which feels like once upon a time, uh, I had actually planned on updating a talk that I did in early February at UCLA on sexual and reproductive health in the United States. Um, and of course, in this moment of COVID-19, it just felt like the most important thing I could do was try to roll up what we know is going on with sexual and reproductive health thus far. But this, of course, is a very dynamic and changing situation. And I happen to know that many of you out there 
are experts in sexual and reproductive health. So I certainly invite you to uh, bring even more up-to-date information or raise other things that you know about when we get to the Q&A and to the discussion. So with that, there's really never a way to talk about sexual and reproductive health and related issues without reminding us that health and illness cannot be simply regarded as biological or medical phenomena. They are perceived, organized, and acted on in a political, economic, cultural, and institutional context. And we could certainly spend all evening if we wanted to talk about the different responses we're having in different places within the United States, the different responses that different countries are having, and the reasons that that is. But it's certainly because um, a lot of what's going on really has nothing to do with the biology. Rather, it has to do with the politics and the cultural kinds of aspects. So that will be very much evident and is always evident when we talk about sexual and reproductive health. So I'm going to dive in with a couple of things, and I want to give credit for uh, this framing to my colleagues from the Guttmacher Institute. Uh, we know that there's already some fallout, and then, of course, there is additional potential fallout for sexual and reproductive health and rights in several key areas related to our healthcare system and the fact that as we are burdened with COVID-19, sexual and reproductive health and uh, many other kinds of health services are more restricted. We have increasing economic barriers to care. I think everybody's well aware by now of the job losses that we've suffered in this country. And then the political decision not to open up enrollment into the Affordable Care Act, which is the decision that was made by the Trump administration. That's certainly gonna create serious economic barriers to care for people who no longer have insurance. We're not completely sure what people's reproductive behavior may be as a result of this and how it might shift, um, but that's something that will emerge. And of course, what we are seeing already is that COVID-19 provides cover for certain ideological attacks on reproductive rights, particularly related to abortion. So I'm going to talk about two areas of pregnancy option. One, which is for people who are carrying their pregnancies to term and having babies during this period of time. And within that, what we know about COVID-19, the risk of acquiring it and severity of illness in pregnant women. Uh, what we know thus far about vertical transmission, rather mother to baby. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about breastfeeding and mother-infant separation guidelines and uh, the variety of guidelines that we're seeing out there. I'll also give some shout outs to providers in the sexual and reproductive health space. And then we can talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of abortion restrictions and all of this in less than 20 minutes, I promise. Um, so why focus on pregnant women. Um, reasons for early concern had to do with the experience that pregnant women had with SARS and MERS, where there was a very high infect infectivity and also poor outcomes. Um, women do have additional respiratory vulnerability during pregnancy. Uh, and of course, another reason for concern is that we already have horrendous rates of maternal death and almost death, severe maternal morbidity in the United States, our rates are the highest of any developed country in the world. So we're adding another variable, this new uh, virus to that. So the good news is that the summary would be that what we currently know shows that pregnant women do not seem to have more severe symptoms of COVID-19 than the general public. But of course, we're still learning, and I'm going to show you the little evidence that we have that we're going on for this. Uh, certainly, we know in terms of prevention that pregnant women and everybody is urged to take the same steps as the general public, which we're all so familiar with now. Um, I'm going to jump to Iceland, which might seem like I've completely lost my mind, but I'm going to tell you that I have more faith 
in this statement about pregnant women because of Iceland, because Iceland is the one country that I've been able to find where they are doing uh, routine testing of a random sample of their population. So we have good public health data. So if you wanna see how the data should be done, take a look at Iceland. But they are also saying that no information has been found to indicate that COVID-19 causes any special risks for pregnant women um, or side effects during pregnancy. So they are not suggesting specific advice either at this time. Uh, but what are we basing everything on here? Um, here are the list of studies that I reviewed for today. I do have a reference slide and people are welcome to be in touch with me and I will share this with you. Um, the important thing to see here is that our sample sizes are very small. Uh, and in fact, earlier today I was excited because I thought I had found yet another study on 38 pregnant women, but it actually is a summary of three studies, one of which was already in my list. So um, the studies themselves were only talking about less than 70 women. And then I am gonna tell you a little bit about, um, I looked at the most recent morbidity and mortality weekly report uh, on people with chronic conditions. They included pregnancy in that. So I'll show you what I was able to make or, uh, from that. So just to give you a feel for some of this, uh, the Chen et al. article uh, found out of China found that the characteristics of the COVID-19 pneumonia in pregnant women were very similar to those reported in non-pregnant adults. Uh, that, that same study found no evidence for vertical transmission for women who developed their pneumonia in late pregnancy. Um, in the You et al. article on seven pregnant women, uh, again, looking at maternal, fetal, neonatal outcomes of patients who are infected in late pregnancy appeared very good. Uh, I would note that outcomes were achieved with intensive active management that uh, is recommended in the absence of a lot of data about exactly what needs to be done. Uh, and again, clinical characteristics were similar between pregnant and non-pregnant people. I'm not walking you through every study, just want to give you a feel for this. Um, in terms of the vertical transmission issue, the largest study is on uh, 33 babies born to known cases of moms with COVID-19 in China. And of those 33 births, only three babies tested positive. In general, when babies have tested positive, they've had sort of mild symptoms. And the one baby in this case that was very seriously ill, they believe was probably symptomatic due to other reasons. Uh, it was a premature baby, also asphyxia, sepsis, and so they think it was for those reasons. But again, you can see we're talking about a small number of cases. Um, I do also want to remind people that uh, pregnancy was handled a little bit differently in China than we're handling it here. They routinely did C-sections on all known positives. Their treatment approach was very aggressive and extensive and also included traditional Chinese medicine, which is not something that we're doing routinely here. And I have to note that there is some doubt that has been cast broadly on reporting of COVID-19 out of China. So while I have no reason to doubt these particular studies, I do think we have to be mindful of that. So shifting to studies here, the Breslin et al. article that was widely reported in the media was on seven women. And I think that the big anxiety out of this is that two of the women who became extremely ill uh, were completely asymptomatic when they were admitted. And in fact, five of women, of the seven women who were later uh, tested positive had no fever, four did not even report a cough. And so during this, uh, these two very serious cases, which were written up in the Breslin article, um, many, many healthcare workers were exposed because they didn't have sufficient PPE even above and beyond the fact that we don't have enough PPE for healthcare workers, they weren't prepared for the fact that these women who came in completely asymptomatic were in fact infected. 
and this is just a sense of how this got rolled up uh, in the news. So women are hearing about this. And I think just a reminder that in the best of times, um, some parts of pregnancy, but certainly childbirth and decisions about breastfeeding and taking care of a baby if you're sick or if the baby is sick are very anxiety producing. So to have to do that in an atmosphere where there's not nearly enough information is particularly challenging. Um, I did mention that the MMWR last week actually took a look at um, people who had reports of underlying chronic illness and just wanted to show you, I'm just showing you two lines out of the table, although I did do the math for you rather than just giving you the numbers as they do in the CDC report. Um, you can see there's not a very big difference between the pregnant and the immunocompromised folks in terms of the percent that are reporting that they weren't hospitalized, hospitalized, or in the ICU. But worth noting that um, for a quarter of even this small number of pregnant women, 143, the hospitalization status is unknown. So I thought it would be worth taking a look at um, how people are trying to roll up the little bit of data that we do and don't have. Um, if you look at the advice related to breastfeeding and infant separation, it's a little bit different when you look at our main sources of information. So the World Health Organization says infected mothers can share a room with their infant and breastfeed, but then everybody is being told to do the respiratory hygiene that we're all doing now, right? Washing our hands, wearing a mask. Um, the CDC and ACOG says that facilities should temporarily consider separating mothers and newborns um, in consultation with the healthcare team. Um, breastfeeding is still generally recommended. Uh, they do want infants who uh, of positive women or suspected positive women to be isolated from other infants. Um, I'm gonna skip down to China. Um, even though uh, we don't have any evidence that the virus is secreted in breast milk in China, uh, they have not updated their recommendation and they're still recommending no breastfeeding. And then earlier today, I saw that in Italy, just on April 3rd, a few days ago, they updated their guidance to actually make a distinction between women who are either positive and under investigation and asymptomatic versus women who are symptomatic. So again, there's conflicting evidence going on. Um, but of course, in our context, we need to remember that there are real world issues that will probably need to drive this even more than the science. So the truth is that formula may not be available to women in many communities. And of course, we know that going to the store is uh, very risky, increasingly risky in our area. We know from clinical partners that new mothers are being discharged as quickly as possible from the hospital to help ensure that they're not infected and also if they're infected that they do not infect others. So there's a real need to establish breastfeeding quickly. Um, there are many remote and free resources related to breastfeeding, but we have to remember that women are going to be scared to breastfeed. So education may be one of our biggest challenges of all. So some other changes that are going on, some I would say are actually very positive. Uh, in some ways in the United States, we've been really slow to get on it in terms of telemedicine. And now everybody suddenly is practicing telemedicine. And of course, uh, we've, we've really changed some of the regulations. We know that for pregnant women, that many, many services can be delivered via telemedicine. And if we can provide women with some at-home tools, such as blood pressure machines, uh, a lot of women can actually very successfully do telemedicine through most of their prenatal time. Um, in fact, I'm very proud to be part of an effort that the Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition is heading up to try to get kits to women, including uh, for women who can't afford it or their insurance won't pay for it, blood pressure machines so that they can take care of themselves at home. 
Um, I also want to give a shout out to my alma mater, Planned Parenthood, for keeping their doors open in most places in the country. We have to remember that sexual and reproductive health services are often time sensitive. And again, while many things can and are provided via telemedicine or remotely, uh, there are services that people need to come in for. So um, a big shout out to the providers who are actually providing care in person right now. Um, but a reminder that uh, certain opponents of sexual and reproductive health care and rights never sleep. Um, and the kind of uh, policy environment that's going on right now and the fear has ended up being an excuse to actually restrict abortion even further in areas that have been trying to restrict abortion further even before the epidemic. So I did want to make sure that everybody knew that there is a very powerful joint statement out on abortion access during the COVID-19 outbreak that was issued by ACOG as well as most of our other leading reproductive health organizations in this country. And they remind us that while most abortion care is delivered in outpatient settings, in some cases, care may be delivered in hospital-based settings or surgical facilities. And to the extent that hospital systems or ambulatory surgical facilities are categorizing procedures that can be delayed during the COVID-19 pandemic, abortion should not be categorized as such a procedure. Abortion is an essential component of comprehensive health care. It is also a time-sensitive service for which a delay of several weeks, or in some cases days, may increase the risks or potentially make it completely inaccessible. The consequences of being unable to obtain an abortion profoundly impact a person's life, health, and well being. So, this is what we in the public health and scientific uh, community believe, but as many of you have probably heard, uh, there are many states, uh, either the legislatures, the governors, or together, uh, that have attempted to ban abortion by calling it an elective procedure and using COVID 19 as the reason. And those states include. Ohio, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa. So far, I'm pleased to report that federal judges have blocked the efforts to uh, put those bans um, and to categorize abortion as a fully elective procedure in Ohio, Alabama, and Texas, and cases have been filed in the other states. So this is a very major place that we're seeing the um, COVID-19 used as sort of political cover for abortion restrictions. And then finally, I wanted to mention that uh, you can also find some sexual and reproductive health politics in the relief bills. Now, you may be surprised because, of course, most of what we're hearing about those bills has to do with the checks that people will get if, in fact, they have filed their income taxes and the government already has uh, an electronic routing number. Um, and then we've certainly heard that there should be some small business relief if the website, the website stops crashing. So you can hear I have some implementation problems with those in general. But you might be surprised to know that um, written in the new the small business loan program, there's a ton of broad discretion to specifically, there's language about excluding nonprofits, serving people with low incomes, and denying benefits. And it's a set of language that points very directly to Planned Parenthood, even though it doesn't say the words Planned Parenthood, but this is often what's been done to target that organization in the past. Um, one of the bills actually puts in the Hyde Amendment, which is the um, amendment from the 1970s that bans federal funding for abortion, except in very rare cases, and that is in there. And then you might also be surprised that we've extended funding for abstinence only until marriage sex education as part of these relief bills. But indeed, uh, there is some funding in for evidence-based sex education, but also abstinence only sex education. And in fact, there was an attempt in the draft bill to put even more money towards abstinence only education, but that was ultimately taken out of the final bill. So um, obviously we are uh, 
figuring this out as we go, but I would certainly, as someone who's worked in sexual and reproductive health for my whole career, let's always pay attention and try to sort out what needs to be done because the science suggests it and what's being done because of politics or ideology. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much for that great information, Leslie. Um, a couple of questions for you. If anybody else has more questions, please put them in the chat box. In one of the studies you were talking about, um, there was, um, the question is, the babies that tested positive, um, were they a result of vertical integration? Of vertical transmission? Vertical transmission, I'm sorry. Yeah, so so in some, if you read all of these, um, they have not seen much evidence of that. However, I mean, so, so the basic thing is people are saying we're not seeing vertical transmission. Now that is one of the studies out of China and they insist that they don't think the baby could have been infected during childbirth because they used cesarean and very rigorous infection control. Uh, but when you actually, again, we're talking about a small number of cases, but when you look across the cases, we're not seeing evidence of it. Again, even the fact that there were only three positives out of 33 suggests that there's not vertical transmission going on. Okay, thanks. And a follow-up to that, we're, were the, I think this was in a different study, it might have been the same one, were the C-sections to prevent transmission from mom to baby um, during the vaginal birth? Yeah, you know, even though that isn't, it isn't articulated uh, really clearly, that, that actually was the practice all the way along in China. And so, um, you know, my interpretation of that is that they were trying to reduce any risks of transmission during childbirth. Great. Um, pregnant women often have to go for routine checkups. Are there any known actions taken to make sure that they do not contract the disease by just going for the tests and procedures in hospitals or clinics in the US? Yeah, so that's a great question. So this is really where, I know I was kind of going in rapid fire. Um, you know, there is a lot of effort being made to manage some of those appointments by telemedicine in order to reduce the number of times that women are coming in. But of course, what people are doing in those practices and in other healthcare practices is things like having people call, doing screening by phone, right? Making sure that people don't have any symptoms, that they don't have any known exposures. Um, and then of course, being really cautious when people go in, right? Limiting the number of people. Um, so I think all healthcare providers are trying to um, do that kind of combination of people only coming in when it's absolutely necessary. And that's certainly true that there are certain tests during pregnancy that must be done, uh, but a lot of people are trying to pivot to managing other uh, visits by telemedicine. Okay, and we have one more, I think. Uh, do we have any previous evidence of the effects that limiting professional birth workers can have on the peripartum experience and outcomes? Yeah, thank you for that. Actually, I, I meant to mention that, uh, you know, so one of the things that has happened in facilities is that visitors are not allowed into the hospital to limit the chance of infection by having additional people in um, and to limit people from becoming infected. Um, in New Jersey, they actually uh, created a rule that people can have one support person with them. So women in New Jersey who are giving birth can choose one person. It has to be the same person throughout. So if they wanna have the support of a doula, then they have to have have a doula rather than say having their partner or spouse. Um, you know, there are some really good outcomes related to, to doula work. And that is why, I mean, it was felt that um, there was enough evidence that having a support person was important that that rule was put in place here. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and one more question as a follow-up to one that was be asked before. Um, so how would the babies have tested positive if not from vertical transmission? Some other exposure after birth? Well, again, 
I, I welcome all of you to take a look at this. And in fact, I have this all together. I mean, it's a very small number. The other studies didn't find it at all. I can only tell you that the authors want to insist that it couldn't have happened during childbirth, but we know that um, there are lots of opportunities for exposure uh, if a mom is infected. I think the most important thing uh, is that even in babies where they've tested positive, that the symptoms have generally been mild and or attributable to another reason. So I realize that sounds a little bit waffly, but that's because I think without the authors um, making a clear determination about that, and because that study looks different than the other studies, I I'm uncomfortable sort of going beyond what the conclusions are in the actual studies that have been done. Great, so thank you so much, Leslie. Um, anybody else has questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm gonna turn it over to Yvonne now to uh, introduce Renee. Great, thanks so much, Mitch. And thanks so much, Leslie, for that fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, but now it's my pleasure to introduce Renee Turchi. Uh, Dr. Turchi is a professor and interim chair of uh, the Department of Pediatrics at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children and Drexel College of Medicine. She's also clinical professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention at uh, Drexel's Dornsife School of Public Health. Uh, Renee completed her undergraduate work at Cornell University and Medical School at Medical College of Pennsylvania, and then completed her residency and chief re residency at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. She attended the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at Johns Hopkins University, where she received her Master's of Public Health. And her research and clinical work focuses on children and youth with special health care needs. And now I turn it over to Renee. Thank you, Yvonne. Just going to share my screen. And I just wanted to actually get the, um, I'm sorry, I need to get the video on here as well. Hold on one second. Okay. Great, so thank you so much for um, having me here today. Um, I uh, wanted to start my talk um, just with a moment of silence for um, all of the COVID heroes um, that are out there um, on the front lines and those doing research and those supporting family members and those also following our um, public health rules. This is clearly an unprecedented time um, in, uh, in healthcare and in the world. So there we go. Oh, I'm having a hard time. There we go. So um, I wanted today to talk a little bit about uh, the value of the medical home in addressing child health and how it's implemented in current practice, um, give an example of some of the work we're doing um, at the Pennsylvania chapter here right in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania of the American Academy of Pediatrics and our medical home program. And I also, in talking about uh, the medical home, wanted to exam examine the importance of community partners and family engagement in that medical home model and also um, at the end, just wanted to highlight some of the work that um, is happening right at Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health with the Maternal Child Health Program. So what is the medical home? Um, I think many folks are familiar with the medical home model, but for those who aren't, um, it's really best described as an approach or a process, a model of care, um, often delivered in the primary care sector, but doesn't have to be. And it really has some of these um, central core components here, as you can see on the screen, as being patient and family-centered, comprehensive and team-based, coordinated across all sectors, accessible, and focused on quality and safety. And we really have shifted you know, from the idea of convincing folks that a medical home is important to kind of really taking it to the next level and saying, how do we find neighborhood? You know, thinking about care, it's not just those physical walls where 
a child or mother or family might receive care, but really that neighborhood, that approach to care. So I'm a pediatrician, so you have to bear with me and thinking about dinner time at, at the end of the day, um, we'll, have, we'll have a little bit of uh, Sesame Street, which we use a lot in pediatrics to be illustrative of um, some of the work that I wanted to talk about today. So we have Big Bird saying, can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street or can you tell me how to get to my medical home neighborhood? So how do we help? So if we think a little bit about the history of medical home, I think that it really plays a salient role in what we're dealing with right now in an unprecedented time of a pandemic and the role of the medical home during this time in history. So when we think about where a medical home in this concept has, has really been born and where its inception was in 1967 um, with a uh, uh, physician named Dr. Calcia, um, who's now in Hawaii, um, who really started talking about medical home relation to patient records. And then we had the Surgeon General Conference um, shortly after that in the late 80s. And um, we had some really, at, you know, the turn of 2000 had a lot of the groups and uh, really pioneered in pediatrics. The first policy statement came out. The Institute of Medicine came out with a report. Um, and in our own Commonwealth, the Pennsylvania Medical Home Program um, was initiated at the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics here in the Commonwealth of PA, um, which is the uh, parent organization for primary care pediatricians. Shortly after that, our adult primary care colleagues um, really got on board with this concept. We're really doing a lot of it all along, but this idea of internal medicine, family medicine, osteopathic medicine all came together in a joint principal statement. At that time, we had Governor Rendell in Pennsylvania, and he started the Governor's Chronic Care Commission. Again, gave us a lot of momentum um, in 2010, we had 10 states that had bills that were passed promoting medical home. The ACA was signed. Um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid were establishing things called accountable care organizations. So really, um, you know, under the Obama administration really got some traction for medical home and payment um, with it that really, I think, kind of moved the wave. In 2018 and all along and all of this, and a, a key point in my talk today is the role of family-centered care, really putting patients and family at the, at the cornerstone. And family-centered care and the quadruple aim, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, really were gaining a lot of national recognition, um, as well as the um, Patient Center Medical Home Committee was born here in Pennsylvania under our own Office of Medicaid in the policy world. And so now here we find ourselves amidst a pandemic, and when you think about the role of having a trusted source, a locus of control um, that families can come to and can really help coordinate and help engage with patients and families, um, the medical home is more important now than ever. And I think for me, um, you know, as a pediatrician and a public health practitioner, the thing that's most important and keeping it at the heart of what we do, regardless of where you sit in this, if it's on the healthcare side, public health side, family, client side is, you know, whoever your clients are, your, your patients, your, your research subjects, keeping that at the heart of what's most important and propelling our ideas, propelling what, um, what really matters um, is, is what kind of promulgates um, for all of us, uh, what we do. So I alluded to the quadruple aim, and I think that that is an important framework for how we think about maternal child health and medical home. And the quadruple aim was really coined um, by Dr. John Berwick um, in the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And the way you really think about the quadruple aim is that, you know, these four constructs that, you know, if achieved really are the ideal way to sort of approach um, healthcare delivery and sort of thinking about um, improving population health. So really getting that public health lens, really looking at overall quality measures, improving vaccination rates, improving public health messaging, um, thinking about you know, how that connectedness is relevant to where we find ourselves today. Also looking at healthcare costs, right? And looking at how in an ideal world, um, we're looking at making sure that we you know, are looking at tests. If you think about um, COVID-19, and you know, right now we're we're really trying to maximize um, the the test care kits that we have, ensuring that they have sensitivity and specificity. Um, 
and looking at how costs and decisions and healthcare utilization and resources are being looked at um, at, at a real pandemic um, emergency. But it's relevant across whether there's a pandemic or obviously in more typical times. Also a big piece of the quadruple aim are looking at um, the patient experience. I like to think about experience as opposed to satisfaction. I think satisfaction is part of experience, but it's not just a satisfaction survey, but it's really, when you're thinking about healthcare and public health delivery. It's, you know, how does this um, really uh, get delivered and what is the end user experience in this case, the patient? And also satisfied clinicians and providers. So what is this experience like um, for those that are interfacing with our patients and families? Um, a number of years ago, as I mentioned, um, the Pennsylvania Medical Home Program, um, that's the Pennsylvania AAP Medical Home Program was born, is, um, is, is still in existence at the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I get the great privilege of being part of a team there, including Eileen Thompson. And this really started as a quality improvement initiative. It has multiple, um, has had multiple funding sources, um, both state and, um, local, state and federal over the years. But really the idea of this program was to work at the state level. And you can see a snapshot of Pennsylvania here, doing quality improvement work at the practice level, bringing to life the medical home constructs um, with primary care in, in both pediatric and adult um, settings. And um, the program that we've been able to work on, um, you know, really is, is part of some of the evidence that's out there supporting medical home. And again, not, I'm not looking to spend as much um, time in this talk um, on um, the pieces of um, the evidence supporting medical home, but really to focus on um, some, some recent work that we've done. But really, there's lots of evidence out there showing that the overall um, you know, satisfaction with patients and families is there. Healthcare utilization is um, often favorably effective um, looking at medical errors and um, efficiency and coordination across sectors. So thinking about getting back to our, our friend um, Big Bird and thinking about patients and thinking about children and adults um, that find themselves in an environment crossing multiple sectors, whether it's in a COVID epidemic or not, care coordination is considered to be a key construct in the medical home arena. And it's really thought to be this set of activities um, that really happens in the space between visits. So seeing a patient or family in your office, um, you know, is obviously there's a lot that happens in those visits with respect to screening, healthcare delivery, anticipatory guidance or education, but often what happens in between those visits where you're linking patients and families to resources, patients and families might be in the, hospital, they might have other interfaces with community clinicians. So really that idea of integrating that care across those sectors um, and really having it be um, from the perspective um, of a patient and family um, across the continuum, um, regardless of where someone may sit. So really thinking about um, a child that you know in this case as I'm focusing on child health, you know, might be utilizing care in um, one institution, but utilizes behavioral health services in another part of Philadelphia, um, has educational needs, might require early intervention services, so multiple sectors, and how do you integrate that care across those um, various sectors? There's a great policy statement that came out in 2014 that really talks a lot about care integration from um, the patient and family-centered approach, so if you're interested or would like that as a resource, um, feel free to access that. Um, this is just a snapshot of um, a study from a couple of years ago that we did looking at, at um, asthma and emergency department visits, looking at um, the amount of time that a child with asthma was getting, um, if you will, a dose of care coordination. Um, so the longer and the more intense the care coordination encounters were, um, in this case, in this particular article, where there, there were statistically significant decreases in emergency department utilization as well as um, school absences. So really thinking about the impact of um, coordination of care, care integration, certainly on healthcare outcomes, but also on quality of life outcomes, like things like school absences or even parental work days missed, quality of life measures, et cetera. So kind of thinking about taking that, that construct into the community, you know, when we think about the community's role in that medical home neighborhood, and we sort of think about, is the community important in a medical home neighborhood? And absolutely it is. I think the community that 
um, a child, mother, family find themselves in um, is really often the most important piece. And I think it's really shifted the way we've delivered care, shifted our healthcare teams, um, shifted our public health teams to think about meeting families, not just in the healthcare arena, but in their actual medical home um, neighborhoods and literal neighborhoods where they, where they are. So to think about that role of the neighborhood and thinking about bringing it real life um, to what we're dealing with right now. Just last week in the Inquirer, there was an article that talked about how the calls to our state hotline have um, fallen sharply during the first two weeks of the outbreak here in the city of the coronavirus. And the article goes on to talk about how, while you know, intuitively you might think that that's a great thing, oh, you know, child abuse and child neglect are on a decline, which is obviously all of our goal. But really the article goes on to talk about why that's bad news. Um, because we know that statistically the rates are far um, higher than what's being reported. And the concern is that in a you know, pandemic, such as we find ourselves in now, where children and families are confined to homes, scared to come into um, clinicians' offices, and also aren't going to their schools, they aren't going to their activities, they're not going to their therapeutic um, interventions or behavioral health services. So the extra supports for families and for the children are not um, being accessed. And so really helps us think a little bit about you know, the, the trauma and trauma-informed care. And also thinking about the notion that, you know, particularly children in certain settings, even children with um, complex medical needs, behavioral issues are at higher risk for child abuse and neglect even without a pandemic. But if you could imagine, you know, the impact that the coronavirus has been having on everyone, um, regardless of social stressors, regardless of behavioral health diagnoses or other, um, socio-demographic factors that might be adversely affecting families, um, it's, it's really been, you know, a, a mental health stress um, outside of the, you know, the physical health stressors that many folks are experiencing. So um, something to think about in terms of, you know, the impact of trauma um, on not just now in the COVID epidemic, but in general. And, you know, the pediatric medical home model is really an ideal setting um, to implement, you know, universal screening for trauma and adversity in clinical practice. You know, bearing in mind that the screening itself of trauma can inflict trauma, so that there certainly needs to be, um, you know, thoughts about how to do that. But when we think about the medical home and certainly in, in pediatrics, you know, there's, um, pediatricians are often caring for children and their families at regular intervals. They have regular touch points. Um, there is often, you know, over time, there develops um, environments of mutual trust and support. And so, you know, it is um, something to think about, but there's also, you know, our own um, Dr. Bloom from Drexel, who is really the founder of the Sanctuary Model, talks a great deal about trauma-informed. And, you know, this idea of having a trauma-informed model of either medical home, healthcare delivery, public health delivery, is one that really demonstrates um, and embraces, you know, the mental models informed by um, trauma theory, and really thinking about not just clinicians, but social workers and caretakers, and how that can inform, um, you know, the impact of trauma. So just to kind of think about that in the context of medical home and maternal child health, you know, this um, comes from a very recent study on, on trauma-informed care in pediatrics. And why I really like this pyramid is, you know, thinking about these areas on the top of the pyramid really that are trauma specific. So thinking about if you are, you know, doing universal screening and understanding um, our own reactions um, and history and the interprofessional collaboration that might occur in a trauma specific care that you might be delivering. But really the, you know, the, even if you are um, in a public health arena or setting that's not doing the universal screening yet, uh, really, the, the bottom two pieces here, the understanding the health effects of trauma and patient-centered in communication and care are really part of this universal trauma precautions that we should all be thinking about um, during any type that we are delivering public health or medical care, but especially um, during such high-stress um, times like the COVID um, epidemic. And so, um, you know, really thinking that, you know, particularly in childhood, we know that, you know, understanding that many adult diseases are really developmental disorders that may have began early in childhood. And, you know, those are really, when you think about um, 
I think about the, the story, if any of you have ever seen the movie, um, Follow That Bird by Big Bird. I don't know if you know his, his story, but we've, I've used this in my own clinical care as a pediatrician. A big Bird is actually adopted. And this movie actually Follow That Bird. Big Bird actually decides that he wants to go. He leaves Sesame Street. He wants to go on and try to find you know, his, um, his real quote unquote family. And he goes on this quest and he starts this trek um, on his own and he finds this, this new family and um, soon realizes that, you know, he um, in doing that actually, you know, in the separation from what his, you know, family, his, his neighborhood, in many ways, his medical home neighborhood um, was not um, what he thought. And um, Miss Finch, who's there, is uh, basically like the um, the social worker, community health worker, and he and all of his um, she that Miss Finch and all of his friends from Sesame Street go to bring him back um, to where he is, you know, in his um, in his element. And you know, interestingly, um, the story of Big Bird and Sesame Street. If you read a lot about it, and if you read about ways to educate um, and talk to children. Um, Carol Spinney, God rest um, his soul, really talks a lot about how Big Bird as a child um, and different areas of um, the various stories kind of talk about what um, life is like um, for a child through the eyes of a child and helping to relate to other children. So whether it's Sesame Street or other things, using um, those types of things to help children understand various life events can be really effective. I wanted to share, um, just some data that um, we've, you know, we actually did some social determinants of health screening um, in my own practice um, here at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. And with an N of just over 240, um, we looked at a variety of needs through our families. Um, and this is actually pre-COVID. And just to kind of highlight in some areas, you know, just at a, a regular routine health screening, um, you know, almost 18% of food insecurity, utility shutoff, um, needs for transportation, and some of the needs for caregiver and child mental health resources are high. Um, into Department of Violence, almost 10% of the sample. So imagine these stressors um, really being exacerbated in times of COVID and thinking about the zip codes um, in our particular sample of this study, kind of looking at the zip code right where St. Chris um, sits in, the percentage of families in this particular study, about 13%, a third of those families in that zip code live in poverty. Um, you know, the, in uh, 19133, 50% of families live in poverty. So thinking about, as you're looking at maternal child health, the, the um, factors that are mitigating and the factors that can be contributing to the stress that families are experiencing. Um, I mentioned Ms. Finch and the role of um, Big Bird, but one of the things that we um, are also spending some time looking at are community health workers and the role of community health workers. Um, in the interest of time, I won't be able to spend too much time on this, but kind of thinking about, you know, community partners and thinking about the partners Partners. Um, these are just a number of partners that we have in Pennsylvania that we've worked with. Um, but thinking about um, whether it's a community health worker or another partner that you might have in the work that you do and this idea of having someone meeting someone, your patient, your client in their natural environment, in their home, in their community um, to um, really foster and understand their needs. So family-centeredness is um, uh, the last piece that I wanted to talk about in terms of medical home. And so, you know, when we think about the role of family-centeredness in a medical home neighborhood, it's core. And families are key members of the team. And they're not just there to, um, you know, take care of children. They are um, the, 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 when we think about the M and the C in the maternal child health, they're interwoven. Inter, um, um, and when we think about pr promoting patient and family centeredness in maternal child health, we think about meaningful engagement of patient and family experts, um, really engaging them using assessments that are evidence-based, recognizing families as leaders, um, recognizing that um, there's a floor that you start with, but there's really not a ceiling. And we wanna keep moving ahead, um, having cultural humility, making sure that we're aware of where we come from um, and what some of our implicit bias is, um, and really this idea of going to the action and engaging our communities and our families where they are. Fostering community communication is key. And I think Big Bird would say that the combination of his family, his community, and his medical home is really what completes him um, with his community in Sesame Street. And so one of the things, you know, we've had um, in our work in the medical home in the Commonwealth, we've had some um, resources, some papers published on how to incorporate um, patient and families in the healthcare delivery, in the um, family-centeredness approach um, and public health delivery. And remembering that 
feedback is essential in any industry. So not just being patriarchal and thinking that we know what families need, whether it's in a COVID epidemic or um, regular delivery of healthcare, but thinking about the opportunities of integrating um, that maternal, child, family, and father health, um, meeting the needs of our families, being nimble, um, meeting their goals, improving their experience, using things like shared plans of care, thinking about social systems and being in their neighborhood, um, understanding responsibilities of all involved, coordinating the coordinators, improving those outcomes, and looking at quality of life, and certainly getting back to our initial discussion about the quadruple aim. So remembering that, you know, right now, all of us are now going to be using the word Zoom as a verb after this COVID um, pandemic, and thinking about the impact that that's had on our patients and families. Um, Dr. Cantor talked about the role of telemedicine. Many of us have had this expeditious rollout of telemedicine with our families. We've done it in the course of weeks. And I can tell you for myself, I had not been using regular telemedicine and now started doing it. And yes, it's given access to our families, but for practices that haven't been doing that, huge cultural shift. I already shared with you the decrease in um, you know, reports to Childline. So thinking about the impact of rolling out telemedicine and how we consent families, let them know what's coming. Absolutely getting that access in this time is critical. I don't disagree. But also thinking about the impact that it is on my patients when I walk into a room garbed up to protect them more than myself. But what, what we, you know, keeping those constructs of patient and family centeredness at the heart um, while we're delivering care in that medical home neighborhood. Um, so, I think that one of the things I, I really wanted to um, kind of um, end with is just thinking about what Carol Spinney would say. Um, and uh, Big Bird went through his very uh, human kind of struggles as a child. No other child character has ever been that complete and detailed. And so thinking about, you know, um, something like the um, Sesame Street, you know, um, and in, you know, in, in all seriousness, thinking about how we can help our children and thinking about how um, this COVID epidemic through the eyes of a child, through the eyes of a family that is already living um, in lots of stress, you know, maybe um, I've had this with myself, several families who rely on public transportation, but are terrified to take that. How do they get to their appointments? How do they access their usual locus of care? Um, I have, um, just wanted to just put a quick plug in for the direct maternal child health catalyst program that we have. Um, we do have um, a certificate program and an MCH minor and um, our students have done an inordinate amount of great work. Um, and so I um, just wanted to, to end with that and um, have my contact information here. So thanks. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that talk, Renee. And um, I'm gonna give people a chance to uh, get some questions on the chat, but while we're waiting for any questions that they may have, I've got a question for you. Um, you talked a little bit about the um, challenges in the neighborhood in which St. Christopher sits um, uh, and the uh, the under-resourced nature of the of the neighborhood and the children that you serve there. And I'm wondering, just I'd love to hear more about your experience. Um, what does it look like? for your kids um, that you serve as um, primary care provider right now in the middle of COVID-19 um, in the neighborhoods that St. Chris serves? Yeah, it's a great question, Yuan. Um, I think that you know, for us right now, the recommendations and guidelines that we're ad adhering to that are coming down from the CDC are um, doing well care for kids less than two um, with the thought of them being able to access vaccines. Many of us are also bringing in children who um, are age four because of the idea that that's the, uh, also a time where you get the measles, mumps, and rubella shot and varicella. So we certainly don't want to have a measles outbreak after this. Um, so we are doing some well visits and we are also bringing in families who um, need to be seen for sick visits. So we're only doing, um, we're only doing that care. Um, all elective surgeries in our area here in Philadelphia have been canceled. Um, the hospital um, is, is really quite a different place. It's really quite, um, it's almost eerie in some ways how few, you know, usually seeing lots of kids bounce around. Um, we recently, been, every day, um, the things we are very much um, aware of what the guidelines are, but, you know, we go from things from one day to the next. We went from having all of our healthcare providers not masked and only using them with patients at risk to everyone getting masked and getting a temperature when they walk in to, you know, masking all patients and families. 
Um, and the other thing, you know, that we've realized too in a lot of this before the community spread, it was like public health in action is that, you know, we really haven't in the pediatric sector, it's a bit different than the adult sector. We aren't seeing as many pediatric positive cases and the ones that we are seeing um, are often coming from their adult parents and we're finding some kids that are positive with very minimal symptoms. So fortunately for children, I think what, what we're hearing from other countries we're seeing the um, I think that uh, been our families is still open for our families, but lots of our families are, you know, saying that they're uncomfortable concerns of sitting and 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 families seem to be very savvy um, about the idea that they need to be six six feet apart. Um, and also I think families are also very concerned for our families that um, you know any of our families aren't in a position to get groceries delivered to their home. So accessing food and using public transportation by definition you know, so we've been trying to um, do things and have, um, I mean, having our community health workers has been really great to reach out, doing a lot of outreach over the phone, doing a lot of education for families and letting them know where they can get um, local resources. Great, thanks so much. And I think that Leslie has a question for you that she's gonna ask, so. Yeah, Renee, I was interested in, you talked about that in your practice, you've actually been doing telemedicine, so it's less of a big shift. But I was interested in hearing in terms of uh, colleagues who are shifting, kind of what's the hard part, what's the hardest thing for the providers in terms of adapting to telemedicine and what's the hardest thing for the families? Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, so I, for us, I think for as providers, one of the things that's really hard is kind of being thrown in the deep end, you know, learning to swim right away. So some of us have been saying that actually this is in some ways probably medicine ahead in telehealth. I think a good thing about all this is that most of us aren't going to undo telehealth. I think that one of the hardest part of it isn't really all that hard. I actually really, many of us are still doing in-person care. And so um, I feel like that disconnect from the family, being over the phone, the privacy issue, the face-to-face -face connection, um, that that is one thing. Also, I mean, just logistically, also just the whole idea of phones are fa like setting up the visits, um, families, you know, having access to stable phone numbers. A lot of our families um, do their phone number range even in trying to connect with them um, and scheduling outreach appointments. Um, I think for, for parents, um, especially many of us rolled out telehealth, um, we were able to do telephone for video. You know, while it seems great in all of us face, there are a lot of issues around rolling telehealth. It takes a little bit of time. Um, and so I think he's understanding that you, and just the, the intimidating part, if, even with a video, if you have it, you are really at a complete disadvantage um, in terms of examining patients and you know, prescribing. We're kind of doing things that aren't, I mean, they're evidence-based in the sense that we're in a pandemic, right? But like I was prescribing antibiotics this weekend, I never would have done that. You know, I, I, would, I would have absolutely brought that patient in. So in some ways we're sort of out of our comfort zone, but trying to, you know, but trying to accommodate. And I think, you know, a lot of the idea, I think you were alluding to this um, earlier about like blood pressure, you know, these monitors that can get families vital signs. I mean, I think that if anything, this is only going to jettison our health care and make it so that families maybe, you know, can, we can all utilize telehealth a little bit, a little bit more and more frequently. And I will also, I just want to put a plug in for Pennsylvania Medicaid that in Pennsylvania, our medical director, Medicaid, Dr. Kelly, is really an, a, a great advocate for patients. I, mean, I think in other states, probably did the same thing, but they were really on the cutting edge in the Medicaid sector, even ahead of some of the private sector insurers about coming out with relaxing the guidelines so that practices who didn't have telehealth set up as a platform could do telephone visits, you know, making the payment such that practices, you know, especially private practitioners who really are, you know, their, their volume was way down, being wanting to be able to support their, their patients, but also having staff, they really came out ahead of the curve. Um, I'm not as familiar with New Jersey, but I know that we're able now, I think you're, you're um, I think we were actually, there was something that came up for a lot of us in Pennsylvania, where we were able to fill something out that we could, if we had families that lived in Jersey, we also could during this time, 
provide services if we needed to. So, I mean, kudos to our policy folks to really, because that, that was part and parcel to some of this. It wasn't just the clinician saying, hey, I'm willing to do this. You really need all those players together. And uh, I thought it was a great example of people coming together. Renee, I've got another question for you from one of the um, attendees. Uh, what are your thoughts on why children are the least affected in terms of COVID symptoms while we see kids with cold and flu-like symptoms often? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I, um, I think that there's, you know, a lot of what we have and similar to Dr. Cantor, you know, um, is reading about the experience in China and Italy. And, you know, in, a, in um, one of the studies that came out talked about one of the um, children in China that really did not do so well was actually a youth that had a lot of underlying complex medical conditions. I want to say, I think um, he or she had a trachiosome maybe around age 14. So the thought is that, I mean, I, you know, and I don't claim to, to know all that the lim literature is so limited, um, but there is, you know, a lot of thought that in general, children are healthy. I mean, we are still seeing some healthy adults get very affected. Um, you know, there's some thought that, you know, and um, I just had a colleague was talking about um, a parent in his practice that was very, very ill, was actually admitted to the ICU, and this adult hospital wanted him to test two of the asymptomatic children who were both positive. So some of the thought is that some of the kids have actually been positive, may have had, you know, we're looking now at these studies of antibodies. You've probably seen people talk about if you've been positive, donate your plasma. So is it possible that some of the kids have been exposed, don't know it? Maybe um, could some of them have even been vectors that we don't know. But I think in general, there's a, a large thought that kids are inherently healthy. You know, it's less than, you know, 20% of kids have chronic medical conditions. So um, I think there's, a, I think we're going to learn a lot from this. And I think as we do a lot of the antibody studies, we'll learn more. But it has protected them tremendously. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, we had a comment from one of the viewers that telehealth is uh, necessity uh, is the mother of invention when it comes to telehealth. So I, I think that seems consistent with what we've heard so far tonight. Um, so there aren't any um, specific questions currently uh, posed for Renee, um, but uh, I wanna open it up to see if there's any uh, questions or comments to anyone, um, to both of our panelists. Um, and we'll look for those. Uh, got an excellent panel. Thanks to all of you. Uh, and I think we, we saw a few of those already tonight. So I think uh, lots of appreciative folks. Um, so Mitch, I don't know if you have any questions, but if you don't, and we're not seeing any additional questions from the attendees, we could probably wrap things up. Yeah, no, I don't have any other questions, um, but I, I, you know, I, I wanna thank Leslie and Renee for their very informative presentations, both very excellent and full of lots of great information. And thanks to you, Yvonne, and, and the Drexel School of Public Health. And, to our participants for joining us today. Um, just as a reminder for everyone to check out the Delta Omega chapters at our schools, and we hope that you have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. And just to note that this uh, talk will be, is recorded and will be posted. Um, I'm actually not sure where but um, presumably uh, on the Delta Omega websites um, would be a good place to start for both, for both of the schools.